Hello and welcome to This Is Us. I'm Becca King Reed. This week we're in Albany, California at Golden Gate Fields. This is the only major racetrack in Northern California. Thoroughbreds have been coming here to race since 1941. This track has really seen some history. Big time horses like Citation, Nor, even the legendary John Henry have raced here. And tonight we're going to take you behind the scenes to meet the people that make racing happen. We're not going to teach you how to handicap a horse or make a $2 bet, but we are going to introduce you to some winners. This is us. This is us. This is us. Welcome back to Golden Gate Fields. Joining me now is Sam Spear, the Director of Media Relations. Thanks for having us, Sam. We enjoy uh, having you and hope you enjoy the day. We're off to a great start. It's a beautiful day and we're really excited to see everything unfold throughout the afternoon. Uh, you've been able to watch that for many years. How long have you been here? Since 1977. I started here in January of 77 and been enjoying it ever since. What do you think makes this track special? Why is it still here after so many years when it's, it's the last big major track in Northern California, right? Well, where it's located is an area that's not going to be developed. It's going to be uh, kind of preserved as a park. So we continue to race here, but we're on the water and uh, we look out to San Francisco. In fact, Herb Kane once wrote in his column that the best view of San Francisco was from the men's room at Golden Gate Fields. <laughs> That's a good story. And you have lots of great stories about this track. Tell me some of the famous, more famous horses and celebrities who have been here. Well, we've had, over the years, uh, when racing was in California, a lot of the celebrities liked to own horses. Harry James and Betty Grable came here with their horses. And uh, Mickey Rooney used to come here. Uh, Jimmy Durante, uh, John Forsythe came here on his horse. Uh, Merv Griffin owned horses, so he came to watch his horse run. Telly's Pop, Telly Savalas, he had a horse called Telly's Pop. So <laughs> when he ran in a big race, we handed out lollipops. And uh, so it's always been a lot of fun uh, when, when different people, when different celebrities came to the races. What about famous horses? I understand Citation ran here and John Henry. Citation and Noor had tremendous battles here at Golden Gate Fields. And uh, this is the home of the very first victory for the legendary Bill Shoemaker. Oh won his first race here in 1949. And obviously went on a tr tremendous career, winning over uh, 8,000 races and inducted in the Hall of Fame and winning the Kentucky Derby three times. <laughs> and uh, Johnny Longden, also a Hall of Fame jockey, who uh, held the record for the most wins at that time and then was surpassed by uh, Bill Shoemaker, who was eventually surpassed by uh, our own Russell Bates, Russell Bates, who rides here today. And I see his numbers are up and everybody's waiting to get him to that 12,000 mark. Right, right. So, <laughs> and he's ridden over 50,000 races. Pretty incredible. Which is about uh, almost two times around the world if you clocked it uh, in regards to miles. It's amazing that he's still riding uh, and uh, after all these years and still winning. He's still the winningest jockey uh, each year for total wins in the country. Well, thank you so much for sharing your stories with us. We look forward to a great day here. And we look forward to seeing you and your viewers at the races. Welcome back. Joining me now is Hall of Fame trainer Jerry Hollendorfer. Thanks for taking time out to talk to us today. Thank you for having me. Now, I read that you are a horse whisperer. What does that mean? Uh, I, actually, uh, I don't think they call me that. A horse whisperer <laughs> is somebody that uh, claims that they can communicate with horses. I, I've not been quite so fortunate in my life. <laughs> can, so how do you get horses, to, if you're not communicating with them, how do you encourage them to do what you want them to do? Well, you know, uh, all athletes are the same, whether they're human or, uh, or animal. And so we have a training program for them. and and uh, put them uh, uh, on our program and, and hope that uh, we can get them to win races that way. Now, when horses are running, do they know they're competing? Do they want to win or they just like to run? Well, that's a matter of observation and uh, I think that uh, a lot of horses know when they're going to run and I think they know when they do well when they stand in the winner's circle and uh, frequently they act a little bit uh, differently once they've won a race. So it changes the way that they run when they win a race? I think so. Hmm. So you've had some, uh, some winners. Tell me about Dakota Phone. Okay, Dakota Phone's a horse uh, that I bought in a two-year-old training sale, and uh, we had him for 
a number of years, and then in the last year, uh, my partner and I, Ted Aroni, uh, won won the uh, Breeders' Cup Mile with him, and uh, he came from way off the pace and a very exciting race and uh, got up the last uh, jump of the race and ended up winning for us. Wow. Is that exciting when that happens? That was exciting, yes. <laughs> now, tell me about Blind Luck. There's a great story behind that horse. Well, Blind Luck's a, a filly that we bought out of Florida, and uh, she ended up winning many grade one races for us and, and uh, a lot of money, a very special filly to have in the barn and very uh, special times that we had with her winning and uh, she was always game and always gave her best on every single race. Now she has an, there's an interesting history behind her name. Can you tell us about the name Blind Luck and how that? Well her sire, uh, her sire was uh, blind uh, in, in one eye and so I think the name comes from, uh, from that base. Okay, well let's take a walk. I know you have to saddle up some horses and I'm going upstairs to talk to Michael Rona. Okay, thank you. Bobby thank Louis you. the middle of the track. It's Bobby Louie moving up on the outside to head Onyx Be Good, then Dan's Plan B, Moonlight Classic, Helm's Magic is next, but Bobby Louie blasting away in the last little bit. The whip is put away and Duran eases down. It's an easy score. Bobby Louie by five from either Onyx Be Good or Dan's Plan B. And then a photo fourth, Helm's Magic. Without... Joining us now is one of the most distinctive voices in racing, Michael Rona. Thanks for joining us. A pleasure, Becca. Oh, this is great. Thanks for stepping out of the booth and stopping up here. Now, I have, a, I have a question I'm sure everybody has wanted to ask a track announcer. How did you get here? What, what led you? What was the career path that led you here? Pretty convoluted. It goes back to the early 80s in Australia. Uh, it goes back to my bedroom floor in my teens when I... <laughs> had decided that I wanted to emulate the race callers I was hearing on the radio and started drawing the colours, the jockey silks of horses of that era on little pieces of paper that I would push across my bedroom floor creating <laughs> these phantom race calls, probably driving the neighbours crazy in the process and my brother to boot as I recall <laughs> and uh, I used to call those fantasy race calls into a tape recorder for a couple of years before I ever went to the racetrack and tried the real thing. So then you would sit in the stands and try to call a race? Yeah, I contacted some of the established announcers, was invited to go and meet them. When a spare booth was available, I could use that. Other times I'd just practice from the back of the stands. I'd play them some of my work and they would tell me what I was doing right, what I was doing wrong. And in those days, there's a lot more of the latter. But <laughs> gradually I kept refining it. And uh, the only way to do it is to keep practicing if you're serious, because there's no school, no classroom that can teach you that craft. So you have to find a mentor. Yes, yes. I had an inspiration in particular, the leading race caller in Sydney, John Tapp. While other kids in high school were idolising athletes or rock stars, I just wanted to be like Johnny Tapp. <laughs> and ultimately, the chance to come to America in 1990 was through him. It was bizarre. It was something I'm still pinching myself over. But Hollywood Park Race Track down in Los Angeles offered him the job. He said, I'm a bit long in the tooth to make a commitment of that magnitude, but here's a younger guy who might be able to help you out. And uh, it was through my first idol, the guy I just wanted to be, that, uh, that I became a, a race caller in the US. Oh my gosh, what a wonderful story. Now, how did you have were the courage to ask these famous people to help you? I don't know where that came from. A bit of gumption, a bit of idiocy, but uh, I thought that I didn't want to still be calling those phantom race calls on my bedroom floor at age 30, so <laughs> I better take the next step and make something happen. Now, what did your family think about this? It's very untraditional. Not many slots ever even open for this. Yeah, it's, it's very uh, selective, um, very few opportunities, but uh, despite the fact that there was no racing background in my family, they were fully supportive and uh, they, uh, they just encouraged me to pursue my dream. I'm very, very lucky. Now, tell me about the most difficult name there is for a horse. How, are there, is there one that sticks out for you that's hard to call? Uh, there are many I've had nightmares over. I'm sure some owners just have a macabre sense of humor. I think <laughs> they've got it in for race callers. But if I had to nominate one, there was a horse here in the early 90s. They spelled the entire breeding backwards. The sire was called Bulger. The dam, the mother of the horse, was I'm coasting. And so this animal went around as Ganitsoak, my Reglob. 
had it was a front runner to boot. Not <laughs> like I could bury it back in the field and just sort of ignore it, you know? It, it got plenty of mentions. <laughs> Thanks so much. Pleasure. Ah, look who dropped in the legendary Russell Bays. Thank you so much for joining us. My pleasure, Becca. Now, it's been, it's been a few years since we did the profile that, we just, that people just saw, and you have reached some more milestones. Yeah, in the meantime, I've uh, hit 11,000 wins. I'm, I'm well on my way, almost to 12,000. And I had my 50,000th ride uh, about a month ago. Holy cow. Wow, 50,000 times you've been aboard a horse in a race. Yeah. Uh, Somebody did all the statistics, and I've, I've ridden enough to go one and a half times around the earth. <laughs> Which would you have rather done, ride in the races or go around the earth? It pays a lot better riding in the races. <laughs> now, you've been doing this, you told me, for 38 years. How, what is it about horse racing that makes you come back every day and do it again? It's just exhilarating being out there on those animals. You know, they're, they're very strong, you know, and, uh, and the competition aspect of pitting my, my own wits against the other riders and, uh, you know, striving to get the best out of my horse uh, it, it's just really exhilarating and, and always uh, uh, challenging now there is work that you do while you're riding the horse through the race isn't there it's not just you hop on and the fastest race wins what tell people what kind of stuff do you do while you're riding along what are you thinking about yeah we don't just keep a leg on either side and hope the horse runs fast enough uh, you know right right from the very uh, beginning you know we get the horse set in the gate you know and have him looking down relaxed but alert and you know we have to help them out of there we make make some noise and get them out of the starting gate good you have to watch you know the position all the other riders get yourself that's why they call it jockeying for position you, you get yourself in the best uh, position you can that that'll give your your horse uh, his best opportunity to run his race do you have any advice for up and coming jockeys you're very successful what would you attribute that success to i think a lot of it has to do with the fact that i learned before i ever rode horses i was a groom on the, on the backside. i i know horses from from the ground up uh, I, I learned to ride on my dad's training ranch, and I think that's a better place to learn than at the racetrack itself. Uh, you, you can get so much more uh, fine instruction, you know, when somebody has the time to actually take you to uh, a, like a small practice starting gate, you can get comfortable in there, you know, and get comfortable on the horses in there. And, uh, you know, if you just have a knowledgeable person at a training track telling you what to do, it's so much better than, than coming out here and having all the pressure of uh, trying to perform. Well, thank you so much for the special advice and for stopping by today. We really appreciate it. My it's pleasure. just about time for us to head to the barn. I hope that you've enjoyed this peek inside racing along with Russell Bays at Golden Gate Fields. I'm Becca King-Reed for everyone at This Is Us saying, see you at the races. This is us.